say, 10,000 times, and you get to this side, you still want to turn that way because you're programmed to do that direction. So you have to practice your left side more so that you build the same understanding in your body that you have right on the right side. So when we're here, you turn in this direction, just so you turn in this direction. So if your body doesn't know to do this, this is the side that's probably stronger. So you go like this, and then it's, the timing is not right. And then when you sink in this direction, is your leg capable of building that idea? Okay, so when we're here, right, sliding step, punch, adjust, set up your elbow so you can launch it in this direction. And then this body's gonna turn and we're like that. So we're one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four. Okay? Now, the butterfly, one, two, should be like that. So those are just samples of what you need to improve on your movement. So that's really um, something that's important. Now, when we're here and we cross, this is your cutting hand, push, pull, down and out if you're doing kunji kun. But we're just folding it here. When we step like this and turn, that's called the hook stance. I brought that up before. When you turn and hook, so when you turn, bring this hand in the direction of that foot and then turn. If I'm turning this way, this. So you have to get, it's called the hook foot. You're hooking like this, but you have to coordinate your body to move. Coordinate your body to move. So every sort of nuance in the movement that you haven't actually saw or you haven't picked up on, then is something that your body's not aware of. So by bringing some awareness and understanding in how the body really works to balance out, your body has to learn to compensate for movement that's what balance is. You know, when you're moving in one direction, your body has to respond in the opposite direction to, to you know, get that, that mechanism to work, you know, efficiently and constantly. Equal and opposite is not just this. That's something that is very apparent. So equal and opposite, every style has this, that's equal and opposite. But when the body moves from one place to another, that equal opposite response has something to do with um, your transition. So as you evolve, that's something that you have to pick on and be more aware of it. If you're just one directional, it's really, or one-sided, then it's really uh, dead movement. It doesn't have the same kind of action we're looking for. So if I'm here, let's do that again. One, two, three. Now, this goes here, and this goes here. This goes here. Now you see my body really, when I step, um, my body's still sort of loading up and then like this. So if I'm here, after I, I do the, the butterfly and I cover and I'm here, I can't let the body go and then do that. So the body, those three postures are not connected. When, you, when you're here and you pick and you lao, right? You have to tie the movement together so that you have synchronization. Now, one thing happens above, something happens below. That's the kind of mechanism you have to build in your movement. So when you move from one posture to the next, you're always set up to move. So your setup becomes the primary part of the relationship between the beginning and end of the posture. So that's something that you have to heighten your awareness of and discover where the change of position is so that you'll understand how to set it up. And that will constantly evolve because as your coordination and your timing be, is improved, then you'll go from one position much more efficiently uh, and the, the movements become like it's seamless. So while the form could be you know, several hundred movements, 
You have to get that to happen throughout the form. So that's another level of skill, and it's a level of understanding where this understanding is not here. This understanding is here, in the body. So when we move, we just know what the next thing is going to going to happen, what, what will happen. So when we're in this position, just say we're here. If we're doing the elbow up, we know from here that we respond and we sink and push. Elbow up, grab, and push. So the body has to learn to respond, respond with the movement. So that's really this. That your body torso movement becomes much more controlled when we do it. Because without the body control here, you really have no strength or power in any direction, right? So, you know, this, in Fuhawk, we have these movements. That's right to left. We have to move in a direction and then balance our movement as if we're moving in space like this, right? So each one of these is a level of counteraction, counterbalancing of those movements. You know, simply, we go like this, that's a counterbalancing of a movement. When I lift, there's a relationship between this and this. Now, if, you, if, you, if I didn't point this out to you, you might not pick it up. If I go like this, and my hand comes up. Actually, my hands are actually moving together here. They're actually balancing and creating an opposite response. Because movements are complete. So movements have like a volume in space. If you don't define that direction, what, like reversing the ball or reversing the hands, you know, we have this in the, um, you know, five images form. We have this in everything that we're doing. You know, Tai Chi has this. It's really like, like this, circular movement, right? So what is this? It's, it's like a medicine, uh, uh, what do you call it, the, the mortise and pestle, where you, where you grind things and you're churning things. You know, when you take something and you do this, you're churning it. You know, it's opposite or it's working together, right? So when we're doing something like this, that's what's happening is the hands, when the hands are moving. So chun, when you chun, when you chun. These, these are all actions that the body has to sort of embody so that when we're doing a movement, it feels comfortable and it's tied to the body. You know? It happens in uh, many, many of our movements, and whether it's Tai Chi or Kung Fu or Mudang Yat Hing We have these actions where the hands combine and separate. In the five images or the image form, you have this when you go to a leopard, right? when you have a leopard form. In fact, when we're here and we step back, that's the drawing of the movement. It's a short bridge and you're using this. Then the hand's gonna do this as in the leopard. So what is that? That's a transition. You're gonna turn out, step up, and thrust down. Then you shift your weight to the corner and then you come up. Then you step down, and then you're going to shoot the hand down toward the ribs and turn down like this. Then you're going to turn with a back fist. Then you're going to drop this hand as this hand comes around like this. Then you release the hand, and you turn, and you end up like this, and there's your uppercut. So those are the leopard movements in Hunga. When we're here, here's that movement. Intercept on the way in, strike, shift, right, lift, step, cross, turn, open, hook, so, so you hook actually like this. Turn, lift. So this hook, turn, and lift is like this, right? So this, this is the same 
position when you're using it as a break. So if someone grabs your hand and you put your hand here and you go like this, you go into the wrist, that's your wrist lock. So that's what that turn is. When you strike, boom, boom, boom. So this is sal. It's really a hook, but angular hook. You're not, you're like this as a strike. Okay. We use it in the form to trap Boom. this, which is a little bit different. If I do this, that's a defensive movement. Or I do this, that's a defensive counter. When I do this, this is learn to grab, strike, press, and to a lean. So there's a give and take there. You know, when we detach, that's really developing a response to. When you, something goes into your hand, you have a, actually a response there. This is a response that infants have in, in the palm of the hand. When you touch it like this, the fingers do this. It's an innate response to make your fingers close. And that actually, that reaction, that sense goes away as you get older. That disappears, but you're born with it. But what ends up happening as you uh, go through life, that particular mechanism starts to get, go away. It's a reflex. Just like when you hit your knee and it goes like that, it's a reflex. Those, some, certain reflexes kind of go away or they dissipate as you get older for some reason. So, but that thing is the mechanism that we're So when you time it, when it goes in here, you, you close, close. So when do you, how do you know when you block when you're going to close your fingers? It becomes a timing mechanism and a reactive thing. So when you grab, when you sink your elbow, your hands will, will close. Where did you learn that strategy? One, when the hands go down, it begins to grab. Then you pull, and then you focus on that. So there is a lot of strategies built into movement in, as a principle or a phenomenon that's built, side in the, built into the form that we may not recognize. We just take, you know, for sort of, for granted that the motion becomes effective, or the motion you know, is uh, purposeful. But the thing is, you really, you're not de developing the reflex action to you bring in the consciousness and mindfulness of your movement and what you're doing throughout the motion. So that's really a, a level of understanding and you know, le level of heightening sensitivity. So, Movements in space by yourself is really building that awareness, but sensitivity becomes feeling. So all of the things that we are doing in the form is feeling through the movements to see where these actions become a reality in technique. Now here, your body is like this. You see, so the action, boom, is like that. This is just like when we talk about when the hand is here, my hand is here, then it comes like that. So that's your action, and then you come in. So that's really horizontal motion. When you get to the 10 Im images form, you're going like this. So there's a timing. And, and the, how your hands and legs move. So that, some people are just doing this, and they're just doing this. There's no synchronization. When you move, you, you have, to, have to tie that movement, because specifically, once that hand goes this way, and this hand goes this way, you have an action. When I'm like this, and I have, a, I have an action, you see the next move is set up, and then I'm going to go here. So all of those little actions become quicker and quicker because why? Our body becomes reactive. It's reactive because our muscles are designed to respond for certain uh, stimulus. So what is the stimulus? Is what you think is going to happen as a reflex. So when we do our forms long enough and our body becomes super intelligent, it becomes uh, a machine that responds to certain stimulus. A punch comes, you know that this is what you're doing to block. And it all comes from position, the geometry of position. And how does it know that? 
It knows that because that's what you're feeding it. The feeding is information. So the information you get is housed here. It's translated, it's interpreted, and it's channeled into the body to teach the body to do this. Then when the body starts to learn the movements and it starts to understand what it's doing, there's feedback and says, okay, this is what's happening, this is what's happening. And then over time, those, that feedback is interpreted again and it becomes an action. And then it becomes again, it becomes a reflex, and it becomes again focus of power. Where does the movement go when you uh, direct the power of that motion? So it's focus, and focus becomes targeting and pinpointing. So when we open the bridge, when we throw a punch, when we lift and we chop a diagonal strike, those are specific targeted areas to focus your movement, to focus your movement, to focus your movement, pull back into a stance. You set up, focus your movement. There's a sort of the finalization of the PowerPoint, the cutting of the hand, boom. When you cut, it's turned the cutting hand, it's slicing through, but where's the action? Where's the force? Where's the connection? Where's, it, where's the directing part of that motion? That has, all, has to be all defined based on your know, physical understanding. Okay, so you know, those two side movements were from the five uh, image form, and let's just give you an idea how the leopard is, because we know the tiger, we know the crane movements, but where is the leopard movements? We have the leopard movements. These are leopard. These are leopard. This is a leopard. So those are like a three-star continuous punch. That essentially is your leopard. And the leopard uses these knuckles. You know, when you look at your hand, that section of knuckles is the leopard. In the phoenix eye, this knuckle is the striker. Now that's the contact point. Okay, so that gives you an idea of, you know, why the movement might come over the top, why the hand thrusts. And this really, in southern styles, is one of the... So, between this... Now, this one you have to actually line like this so that you have this position. You turn like this because the angle, it's for striking toward the ribs and the ribs, ribs are slanted like this, so when you slice into your opponent, you want to angle the hand to go parallel with the, the rib dimension so that you can strike specifically, either break the rib or you go through between the ribs to damage the connective tissue that's in here. So when you sh strike, your strike is like that. You have to release the power, release the power, and then the hand comes around. So the power comes from the rotation of your hand. Okay, so that's how the hand actually would move. So what, what happens, your shoulder has to be relaxed. Don't tighten the shoulder because it's not going to get the torque required to execute in that movement. So the hand strikes like that. So that gives you an idea. When we throw a technique to develop focus and power, you have to maximize its potential by the integration of your body, and then utilize the skeletal positioning to create the you know, most effective strike. So when you strike like this, and you strike like this, and you strike like this, or you strike like this, the potential of each one of those strikes is maximized by the direction of its movement and the effectiveness of why it would be doing this versus this. Why not go here and then do this? It's because the body form for this is like this, or like this. Just a drunken fist, we're like this. So we always look at it this side and this side. But actually, when you're here, and when you're here, and when you're here, you, these are actually, this is using the bottom hand, this is using the top hand. But depending on what you're doing, but if I go like this, and I go like this, I strike like this and I strike like this. This hand goes here. It's not going to go here because my direction of movement is here. You see, so, so this is drunken fist. One, two. Almost like a dropping palm. So if you know your dropping palm and your back fist, 
Boom, 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 boom. Are three different techniques from th three different sources. You had the source from the drunken fist, or you had the source from the middle block, you have a dropping palm as a variation, and you have a back fist, and you have combinations that are developed that become somewhat innate in the body because if something sort of stops it here, how do you change your direction and respond with a, an effective technique? It has to do with how familiar you are directionally with that movement. So essentially everything that we do is circular in two directions. So if I go this way, I can go this way. If I go this way, I can go this way. I can go this way. So you can blend the combination moves. We have uppercut, sliding step. Is this a movement that we have? We have it. In fact, that uppercut and sliding step, which is in the first form that you learn, Mofakun, right? You have press, uppercut, sliding step. Later on, when you learn, say, the 10 minute images, you have the uppercut, you have the punch. You have the uppercut, and you have the punch. That essentially is the same movement, but the thing is, we're here. We're here. We're here. What is that? You punch, you strike. So that's what you're doing. You uppercut, you change directions. So that's what the technique is. When someone hits you here or blocks here, instead of, you can't go, it's a hit, hits. The blocking point is, that's limited, so you have to re, release, and then you go up. So you're taking the movement, doing this. So there's your sensitivity. Boom. Another thing is when you're here, if you're here, then you have to retract and change directions. So that's part of skill. You know, knowing your sequence inside and out, fast as you can do it, without thinking about it, is just knowing your form. Response time, technique, how they change from one position to the next, you know, in a coordinated fashion, in a reflex action, is another stage of it. So we're, how do you define skill? Is skill just your form? Is skill just the way you use the technique? Is skill just understanding? Is skill, it's all of the above. So to be, you know, a total practitioner of the traditional arts, you have to understand, you know, different, different levels of, of the form. Different levels, sequential level, speed and power, application of those techniques, principle and concepts, body mechanics, um, you know, the theory behind how the body moves. Those are all, you know, you can put it into categories. It's, it's like a science, you know, so traditional martial arts is not simple. It's very complex. So, you know, as a practitioner, those are the stages of development that keeps you, you know, excited, that keeps you motivated to continue to practice because ultimately you really don't know what limits your body has, or we don't know the limits of the human body uh, or its capacity to learn different new things and different combinations. So if you take all the forms that we have, all those principles, all those strategies, all the varying techniques, and you merge it all together, how many combinations of this concept can you come up with? It becomes, you know, unfathomable. It's kind of infinite as far as how you can think about it. So for every individual who's practicing, every technique that you do is going to be uh, something that you like, but the next person might like something else, next person likes something, but the combination of all of those variants become something that um, becomes unique to the individual. So that's why, in, in a sense, after the traditional form, we all you know, evolve differently. So that gives you the diversity of, of the training and gives you the, this, the reason why everybody that does forms looks so different. And as a result of that, you have stylistic differences. In Hungary, we have seven different lineages, all practicing essentially the same forms with a slightly different interpretation of what it is. Now, what is the best way of doing it? That's something that you're gonna have to figure out based on your anatomy, your skill, your level of un, uh, uh, understanding. Uh, but if you bring in structure, you bring, bring in geometry, you bring in um, you know, the science of exercise, or you bring in 
um, other principles and theories that we abide by, whether it's physics or it's science or it's uh, medicine, whatever it is that's a principle that's brought into how we move, now your understanding changes and it gets more specific. Then the correctness of all of that becomes more targeted and more important and more, uh, more true to what you think you would want to be. Right? So efficiency, speed, accuracy, all of these things come into play as ultimately the goal regardless of what system you practice. So, you know, throwing a punch and it's not accurate and it's sloppy and it's not timed and it's isolated can't be good. So those are the things that you have to sort out in your own practice to dis decide, you know, how do I learn, how do I practice, and, you know, what are the important things I should focus on as I, I evolve. So let's see how much time we got. Okay, so, so the, uh, you know, we went through those, those few movements in, in the five images. So part of, you know, the five images, we have the opening to the form, and, you know, that opens just like Gung Ji Kun, okay. So when we open, we have this series of movements. Then we, instead of doing this, so we go like this. And we end up here. Now the hands should be facing your kidneys, and it's facing with the palm in. So you roll your shoulder, you open three and a half steps, or three pivots, and you're like this. And your hands are crossed right where your waist is, okay? You see the camera now. Make a circle, this hand goes up, just above your eyes, right where the forehead is. And you go down, elbows, vertical. Open, open, <sighs> out like this. You lift up, one, two, elbows in. <sighs> so your thumbs are straight and sticking out, and it's four fingers pointing up. Okay, so that's here, underneath, lift, of the fore, just about forehead, pick, open, in, open, thrust, <laughs> laughing sound, thrust, pull back, one, two, Three. Okay, so that essentially is the opening to the iron wire form. There's two other halves. Um, the iron wire form is Hungar's fourth pillar form, but this is called the iron wire head, sort of the first segment of the form. It's the beginning of the five images form. It's also the beginning of the ten images form. And it's the breathing, just sort of the introduction to the breathing apparatus and the breeding mechanism that we use in our training. So, you know, if you differentiate between uh, qigong and what they call nei gong or nei gong, qigong is breath and movement. There's co coordination, breath, breathing and moving, like tai chi and everything. Actually, everything that we're doing is breath and movement, and it's focus. So everything that we're doing is a form of qigong, and you're also um, doing those in standing positions and meditation. But Nui Gong or Nui Gong is different. The difference is that when you do the breathing and you expand, you're using a, a tremendous amount of body form, body strength, and the breath becomes much more pressurized. So the pressurization of that breath and holding and increasing that breath with the manipulation of your body strengthens the insides. And the inside strengthening is directed to your organs. So how else can we exercise our organs other than through changing pressures internally? So that's what Neigong is, to strengthen and build uh, strength and energy in the body. Now most of our movements are voluntary. We train ourselves and we direct it from the brain. Now on the inside, you have your organs that really, you, they function, but you can't really 
touch them or do anything other than through the manipulation of your skeletal structure. So that's one of the benefits of doing those kind of uh, exercises by breathing and changing the body form, the twisting and the combining. All of this is changing positions inside because the organs are just kind of there. So what has to happen? And then when you stimulate that movement and cultivate the movement with breath and movement and increased circulation, then you, sit, you send nutrients and energy throughout the body, and ultimately that should be a, not just a health benefit, but strengthening you internally um, to be able to um, resist getting hit, or if you get hit, that your body will recover better because you're not going to have the bruising and the internal hemorrhaging or things that will happen on the inside. So that's really uh, what should happen. Now today we don't go out in the field and get um, bombarded and get hit and, and attacked all day long, so we don't know if your recovery rate is going to be like that. But that's the theory and the goal. You know, so without actually doing the research to find out whether that actually happens, you're going to need someone that you can bang up to see what the recovery is. So I don't think that's going to happen. So we just have to take it on a theoretical basis that when we do this and we turn, So we have to assume that that is really what's happening and that we, with the sounds, which creates uh, resonance and the resonance creates vibrations and all of that that ripples through the inside of your body all the way from the top of your head to the inside of your body. If there's um, truth to what we're talking about, then you'll get the benefit. But, you know, there's no harm in doing it. So, you know, doing it is... Uh, if you can learn it, then it would be better uh, to have that, um, you know, sort of method to do something that you normally would not be able to do or have access to. So that's why um, in Chinese martial arts, traditional arts, has some pretty deep concepts that um, hasn't really been explored. Uh, but the thing is, you know, there is still um, a controlled motor skill apparatus tied to your breath, your movement, and what goes on within the realm of the system, which is pretty complicated. So on that note, I um, hope you enjoyed this. And uh, I'll see you next week, because on uh, Tuesday we'll be live streaming again. We always start off Tai Chi in the morning. We move to the kids' class, mixed together with uh, actually the adult, intermediate, beginners. And then we move on. We have a, a Parkinson's Foundation class that we do, and that's been growing a lot, because uh, Parkinson's and motor skill, it's a tremendous benefit. So anyone that knows someone that has Parkinson's, they can tune in and uh, watch those videos because I, the information I have in every class is really targeting sp specific and specifically to um, the, the people watching and the demographics. Then we get to the ad adult uh, pillar forms, which is, the you know, forms are so long that there's so much information. I could, print, I could spend hours and hours just kind of talking about, uh, you know, how, how and why we should do a lot of these things. But anyways, on that note, uh, I'm going to sign off and hopefully you can continue to follow us, give us a thumbs up, subscribe to our, uh, uh, you know, whatever it's social media or websites. Mimeo is part of, the, part of that. And by doing that, that will actually benefit, help us um, keep this going. All right, we'll see you. Have a good weekend.